Welcome to this podcast entitled Introduction to Protein Ligand Docking, otherwise known as docking. What we're going to talk about in this podcast is a little bit of uh, how you take a receptor, uh, which is a structure in the body, typically a protein, and bind it or dock it with a ligand, which in our case is going to be the drug molecule. So let's get started. So a little bit of docking defined. This is the process of trying to find the best relationship between two molecules. In the graphic there to the right, what you see is the large protein structure. And inside that protein structure represented, you can see it there inside the green, this is where we have docked or inserted or, or bound our ligand. Okay? So what we're trying to do is find the relationship between two molecules, and in our case in medicinal chemistry, we're talking about a protein receptor and a ligand, which of course in our case is the drug. So we have the receptor, again, which is typically the protein. We have the ligand, which is typically the drug. And of course, best for those of you who took computational chemistry, you should understand this. Best in our case means the lowest energy state of the receptor ligand complex. So we're trying to find that configuration, those binding energies that result in the lowest possible energy state uh, we are able to obtain. And this is all part of the field of molecular modeling. So when we talk about molecular modeling, uh, certainly protein ligand docking is one of the most important applications of, of molecular modeling. This is something we uh, did not talk about, for those of you who took computational chemistry, this is something we did not talk about in, in ComChem. We mentioned it a little bit, but now you'll get a chance to actually um, experience protein ligand docking or docking as we generally call it for short. Okay, why do we dock? This is uh, a key component of pharmacodynamics or PD. Okay, and pharmacodynamics, if you recall, we're interested in what the drug does to the body. Okay. Remember, in pharmacokinetics, we're interested in what the body does to the drug, how the body changes the drug. In pharmacodynamics, we're interested in how the drug changes the body. And obviously, we want it to change the body in a way that uh, results in a therapeutic effect. In other words, the patient gets better or cured or whatever disease that he or she has. And drugs basically work by interacting with protein receptors. So again, the graphic over there on to the right uh, sort of the, the white blob stuff, it represents the um, surface of the protein and the red and blue stick figures, uh, that's the ligand or that's the drug that has been that is currently interacting with the protein receptor. And docking helps to decide if a candidate drug will interact appropriately with a target receptor program. So we talk about candidate drugs and target uh, receptors or targets for short. So before we go into the, into the organic chemistry lab, we want to do some computational experiments to help us decide, even if we make this, this ligand, even if we make this drug, is there a likely chance that it's going to bind appropriately with the receptor that we're interested in? And if we find out through our computational experiments that it's unlikely to bind appropriately, then the pharmaceutical company may say, well, I don't want to spend the time and the money uh, actually making this drug and doing the experimental work in the, uh, in the organic lab to see if this thing is going to work. Um, so uh, some general terms, and you've read about these in your textbook a little bit, drug interaction with a receptor can be uh, either a, a, what we call an agonist or an antagonist. And you've probably familiar with the term antagonist from English literature, has similar uh, but slightly different meanings in medicinal chemistry. Okay, let's look at those a little bit, agonists and antagonists. Uh, as the slide here shows, agonists are drugs that occupy receptors and activate them. So over on the left-hand side there, you see that we have the blue uh, ligand, uh, that's the agonist, and that's coming down and that's interacting with the receptor, which is the rectangular orangish structure there. And when that agonist interacts with the reactor, a uh, receptor, excuse me, that results in full activation of whatever that receptor does. And we'll talk about that later. 
Okay, on the right hand side, we have an antagonist alone, and basically these are blocking agents. So the antagonist comes in and it also binds with the receptor, but in doing so, it prevents some other compound from binding with that receptor. So basically it's a blocker, okay? It comes in and it fills up that receptor space. And because that receptor space is now filled, no other chemical can get into that receptor and that results in, in no activation. In the middle there, you see it's a possibility that uh, both the agonist and the antagonist can um, simultaneously interact with the with the receptor. In this case, what we get is we get some activation of the receptor, but less than if we just had the agonist working alone. Okay, so uh, here's uh, a, a graphic that tries to show a little bit about receptors. And in your textbook, you should have read about the different superfamilies of receptors. And we gave you, the textbook gives you four different types of superfamilies. We call them cleverly one, two, three, and four. Um, so what this graphic is showing is that many drugs uh, that we uh, develop and, and give to patients are what's called non-selective. They're not very good at differentiating some of these, uh, the different receptor subtypes. So they will interact uh, equally with uh, receptor types one, two, three, and four. And what you notice there is in, for you know, some particular drug, if the drug interacts with uh, receptor type number one, it will result in the desired therapeutic effect. But the fact that it, re it reacts with uh, receptor types two, three, and four means that we call, can cause results in side effects. Obviously, the ideal, <coughs> excuse me, the ideal situation is to have a subtype selective drug, in other words, to develop a drug that only reacts with the uh, specific subtype receptor, in this case number one, that will result in the therapeutic effect. Needs to say this is very difficult to do. Okay, so here's a, a more specific example. Uh, in this case, our ligand is a thing called adenosine. And in this case, we have four uh, types of receptors and that that well we have one type of receptor called A and there are four subtypes of receptor A called A sub 1, A sub 3, A sub 2B and A sub 2A and the subscripts by the way refer to uh, subtypes of re receptors so in this case we have a receptor type A and then there are four subtypes so the adenosine ligand comes down and it binds with each of these four uh, subtypes. And if it, uh, if it bonds with or reacts with um, uh, subtype A1, that uh, in this case results in the release of a G protein. Okay? In this case, we call that, you may not be able to see it there, it's called G sub zero. And this particular G uh, protein moves over to the left and will result in the opening or closing of an ion channel. And you've read about that in this, this week's reading, okay? Um, or it may be the case that interacting with uh, subtype uh, receptor A1, or in this case also A3, will inhibit the production of a enzyme called adenylate cyclase, which has something to do with the creation of uh, or in inhibition of a, ends, a compound called AMP, adenosine monophosphate. Um, the other option is the ligand interacts with subtypes A sub 2B or 2A. And in this case, it will stimulate the production of adenylate cyclase. And if you look at the table below, you can see the effect. So for example, if we're doing something with receptor subtype A1, that will have some impact on the heart. It will have some impact on the central nervous system. It'll have some impact on the kidneys and it will have some other uh, impacts such as hair growth, which might be a good thing for me. Okay, interacting uh, or in, uh, uh, interacting with reactor receptor subtype A sub two uh, has effects on the heart and the central nervous system. A two uh, B 
only interacts with things like um, other things, allergic responses, gastrointestinal tract. It's an anti-inflammatory. So this chart below here shows the therapeutic effect, either good or bad, of interacting with these various subtype receptors. Okay, uh, now moving into docking a little bit. Uh, we This is straight out of Wikipedia. That's a uh, really, uh, there's a nice reading on uh, doc, molecular docking in there. I encourage you to take a look at that. So here's the terminology that you need to be very familiar with. By now you should be familiar with the concept of a receptor. And again, most commonly this is a protein. It can also be a biopolymer. Uh, the ligand, they also sometimes call it the guest, is the complementary particle, a partner molecule which binds to the receptor. And again, these are most often small molecules, and in our case, they are drugs. And docking is that computational simulation of a candidate ligand binding to a receptor, quite simply, and we call it docking. The binding mode is the orientation of the ligand re relative to the receptor, as well as the conformation of the ligand and the receptor when bound to each other. You should those of you who took computational chemistry, and I think we did this lab in MedChem, where we look at changing the bond lengths and the bond angles in a molecule, and that's known as a conformational change. So conformations means different structures or different shapes of the ligand molecule. A pose is the term we use for a candidate binding mode. So how does the ligand uh, bind to the uh, po uh, protein? And that's called a pose. Uh, scoring is the process of evaluating a particular pose by counting the number of favorable intermolecular uh, interactions, particularly hydro hydrogen bonding and hydrophobic contacts. Ranking is the process of classifying which ligands are most likely to interact favorably to a particular receptor based on predicting the free energy or the energy state of the binding. So over the next couple of weeks, you're going to hear an awful lot of these uh, six or seven uh, terminologies in terms of docking, so we'll need to get those in your head pretty quickly. Okay, what I'm going to do here is a little bit of uh, docking simplified. I took a bunch of screen uh, shots of the project that you're going to do this week with the Molegro docking software. So here's docking simplified, so here's a short list. You're going to obtain a receptor. I'm, this is almost always a PDB file, which means you need to know it's four um, uh, character PDB uh, code number, uh, such as 1HVR, that's the one we'll be working with this this week. You need to obtain a ligand, and this is also typically going to be a PDB file, and we can modify ligands using uh, technology such as the computational chemistry server, um, and you will do this in the lab. I will give you a sample ligand. We'll take a look at how it docks with a receptor, uh, then we'll extract the ligand out of the receptor. We'll put it into the CompChem server, WebMO. You will add some things to the ligand. You'll put the ligand back in the docking software, and you'll see if your change to your ligand molecule uh, docks better or docks worse, and we'll see how you do with that. Okay. So once you have the receptor and the ligand, you import both of these into your workspace, uh, which is your docking workspace you decide which ligand bonds are rotatable. Okay, remember, some of, these, um, some of these bonds we're going to make rigid, so we're not going to let them rotate. Some of the bonds we're going to make them flexible so they can rotate. And the more bonds you have that are flexible or rotatable, the longer your computational docking uh, simulation is going to take. One of the nice things that this software does is it predicts for you which bonds are likely to be rotatable and which are likely to be fixed. And that's a really nice aspect of this software. Other software packages, you have to specify for every bond which ones are going to be flexible and which ones are going to be rigid. Okay, That's one of the nice things about the Malego software as compared to the other packages that are available to us. Uh, protein bonds, we typically make them all rigid. Uh, you can make some of them flexible. But again, there's hundreds and hundreds of, of, of bonds in a protein, and if you make those flexible, the simulation will take forever. Then what we need to do is identify potential cavities, and a cavity is a reasonable place for ligands to fit. And again, the molecular software that we're 
fortunate to have available to us. It does a really good job of helping us predict potential cavities, and we'll get to take a look at that in a moment. Okay, then we have to define a search space. We don't want to try to uh, insert our ligand into every available cavity. There may be five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten cavities in a particular protein, and we want to try to limit our our docking to those cavities that are most likely the uh, most logical one uh, where our ligand will fit. We need to define the parameters of the docking. We need to define how many different uh, poses we want it to try. We want to define uh, how accurate we want our docking to be. Uh, in our beginning stages here, we'll basically let the software decide for us what these parameters might be. Uh, it's a pretty smart piece of software. And once we define our ligand and our receptor, it does a pretty good job of figuring out for us what the best parameters uh, might be. So until we get a little bit more experience, we'll let uh, the software help us figure out what these might be. And then we run the docking. And again, these are long runs. So you are hereby warned uh, for labs that you might be doing this week, next week, and certainly for your case study. There's nothing you can do to make the docking go faster. So you need to give the, the com computer ample time to do the docking, and which means starting early. This is not something that you can start the night before or the night that something is due and expect to get any results. Okay, so be warned. Okay, then you analyze the results and hopefully make some intelligent decisions about uh, uh, which ligand, where the ligand might go, what the base, po what the best pose might be, or the best conformation might be which is the lowest energy, so on and so forth. Okay, so let's take a look at some screenshots. Okay, so here I am importing the, the, the molecule. In this case, I'm going to Im, Im, import both the protein and the ligand. And what you notice there is there are four proteins. In this case, we have one protein with four different subparts. So there's a chain A, B, C, and D, as you'll see when we do this. Uh, I'm going to import three ligands. There are three ligands associated with this particular protein, but I'm only going to care about one of the three, and I'll show you when we do the live demo how to choose the most appropriate ligand. Okay. Um, here's a snapshot of what the ligand looks like already imported into the receptor, and you should be able to see uh, the, the, the wireframe is the protein, and if you look carefully, you can see three ligands um, in bonded in the receptor. You see the big one in the middle there. You see a smaller one to the uh, middle left, and you see a smaller one to the top, sort of to the right a little bit. So we're only going to care about the one, one here, uh, the larger one in the middle. And I'll show you how to um, <coughs> remove the other two ligands so they're not distracting us. Okay, so we need to think about where to dock. And what I've done here, and you'll do the same thing in the lab, is I've removed all the ligands from the protein and we need to be able to look at this uh, uh, protein and try to make some just eyeball intelligent decisions about where this where a ligand might go and I've rotated the protein to make uh, this pretty obvious this is why we choose this particular protein it's a very easy one to do um, and the docking site uh, is pretty clear you see this big hole uh, right in the middle, and that's a logical cavity or a logical place where we can dock our mo our ligand molecule, and that's indeed where we will do that. Okay, all right. So I'm going to run uh, on the docking software. I'm going to ask it to detect some cavities, and I ask it to detect at least uh, up to five cavities. And in this case, it only found one, which is good news. And you know, you should notice if you look back a slide. Uh, that the cavity that it detects is exactly where we expected it to be. It's right there in that big hole in the middle of the protein. So that green blob there represents the cavity that's available to us in which to put our, our ligand. Okay, what we need to do now is to find a search space or a binding site. So uh, if you look at the window to the left, um, it, you'll see something about a scoring function. We'll talk about that a little bit later. There's different options we have there. But under binding site there, uh, I can, that red, or excuse me, that green sphere there represents where I'm going to ask the 
uh, computer to try to bind the ligand. And I can change the size of that sphere by changing the radius. I can move in an XYZ fashion. I can move the sphere around. I can't rotate it here, but I'll do that when we do the live demo. But what you should notice here is the cavity that we detected a moment ago is uh, pretty much uh, encapsulated by the uh, binding, the search space, the binding site space. So uh, the computer is going to try to put a ligand in that, in that space there, and hopefully it'll get it into inside the cavity as we want it to do. Okay, we now want to set parameters, and again, as I mentioned a minute ago, we'll pretty much let the computer uh, choose these for us. Uh, the big choice that we want to do here is up under search algorithm, the number of runs, and I'm going to, uh, in this case, the default is typically I'm going to do 10 runs. If uh, you really have an idea of where this ligand goes and what the correct pose is and what the correct confirmation is, all that stuff, you can reduce the number of runs and that'll speed up your compute time. But typically we want to let the computer do uh, what it wants to do and give us our data. Notice there the box uh, is checked that says constrain the poses to the cavity. So that also helps to, if we know where our cavity is, um, that will certainly speed up our computing time, which is always a good thing. Okay, um, once we do all that, uh, it will tell us if there are errors or warnings. Uh, in this case, I didn't get any errors or warning, and that's always good news. We'll uh, try to give you examples early on where you don't get errors or warnings. Um, and as you get more experience and get the, to develop your skills in protein docking, then you'll have to figure out what do I do if I have an error or a warning. Okay, all right, now I'm going to um, basically uh, going to tell it to, I want it to run the docking in a separate process. I can click on the uh, button that says create a docking script job and I can run it now. Those of you who took computational chemistry are uh, familiar with the idea of creating a job file and being able to run it later. Uh, we'll run all of ours in a separate process and we'll run it immediately. Uh, the data is going to be output in a uh, in whatever directory you want, I would typically encourage you to leave uh, leave the output directory at whatever it thinks it wants to do. And once we have all these things set, we're going to save this. We're going to do the hit the start button and go from there. Okay, and you'll when you do this in real time, you'll see it's starting to run the job. So notice here, uh, I took a screenshot after it started to do its first run. It's calculating an energy grid. And it's very instructive for the first couple times you do this to actually sit there and watch the console and see what kind of messages it's giving you as it runs this, runs this job. So typically when you do a job, those of you who get into computational chemistry know, you start the job, you go away for a couple hours, you come back when the job is done and look at your results. I would very much encourage you to, to uh, Get yourself a cup of tea or a Coke or something, and when you run these jobs, sit there and just watch and read the uh, batch job files and see what kind of information it gives you, and you'll learn an awful lot about docking by just watching the output file. Here's another screen snap of where you notice there where at the bottom there, I'm on iter I, I have my iterations going on. It starts out with the lowest energy of 64, and then the next iteration, it, the energy is lower, it's 38. Then the next iteration, the energy is even lower, minus 63. So again, this is something really good to, to watch and watch how your energy decreases as we go through that. Okay, You can also watch this, uh, the energy changing graphically. And I clicked on the graph tab. And you'll, again, we'll do this in a demo. And you see the energy of the docking really going down. Okay, so you see it above 50 at the beginning, then it's down to 38. Now it's down to minus 63 or so. So if you want to see your results graphically, you can look at the graph and see how that goes. Okay, the final results is it found three poses um, that it thought were the, the best choices for me. And notice that the it gives me a score there. And we'll talk about what those scores mean when we do the... Um, 
the, the live demo. So now I need to pick which score I think is the best and, and go from there. And then uh, in this case, I imported my, I found three poses. And in this case, I'm comparing two poses. I can't uh, rotate those, but we'll do this in the demo. And I have pose one uh, over top of pose two. And you should be able to see even from this static graphic that they are slightly different conformations. They're slightly different structures. So things are offset a little bit from each other. It's easier to see when we can do this and you can rotate it, uh, but this gives you an idea of what you're gonna be looking for, okay? And here's now what I've done is I've taken one of my poses, one of my conformations, and I've inserted it into the, uh, into the cavity. And what you should notice there is it doesn't completely fit into the cavity. I got some things sticking out, okay, which is okay. You should also notice that there are places in the cavity where the ligand isn't filling anything, okay? And that will be something we do in the lab is can we add some stuff to fill in these gaps in the cavity? And by doing so, do we get a better, um, a better structure? Next up, when we do this uh, in the Luminate session, we'll do a live demonstration and then we'll give you a chance to try this on your own. So we'll see you online. Thanks very much.